Hello everybody and welcome back to this new video. Today we're going to be talking about another challenge from the intro to binary exploitation uh, track from Hack the Box. This is Bad Computer, last time we did Chiefs, uh, where we explained it in a very low level way. But with Bad Computer, this is already a little bit of more difficult challenge, so let's jump into it. We get a file that we can download again. So if we take a look at that file, so we take a look at the file, we see, okay, it's a binary. It is stripped in this case, which means that all the symbols, all the function names have been taken out of it. Um, and all right, so like last time, we are going to jump into Ghidra to take a closer look uh, because Ghidra can generate pseudocode for us. So that's this here. So we have four functions that have weird names. They start with fun and then the address where they occur. Uh, a couple of these are nothing. This one is like an initialization uh, function for setting the buffers. But then we have this main function here, which is going to do the main bulk of the functionality. So first, let's look at um, what this binary actually is. What does it do? So if you run it, it says, welcome to your bad computer. What would you like to do? And we can either track the joker, which is then going to print an address for us, or we can chase the joker. That's going to require us to enter a password. So all right. I entered a random password and the password is wrong. Well, let's check what the code does. So this pseudo generated C code um, is generated from the assembly because I don't know assembly that well. So I like having this, it makes it way easier. So this function is going to be in an infinite while loop. So I'm going to print as the prompt and it's going to scan f this a, a integer. That's why it says percentage D here. Uh, and it's going to put that into this integer variable. Okay, it's then going to check what that value was, so either a 1 or a 2. Uh, if that's a 1, then we quit this first loop and we jump to the password. Nope, that's not there. It is not, if it's not a 1, we skip to, this, uh, to, to um, the other one. But if it's a 1, we print this string, and this printf has a, um, a p in it here for formatting. So it's going to print uh, this stack, this buffer, I guess it is. Yeah, it's a buffer of size 76. It's going to format that into the string. Now, what does this formatter mean? Well, we can easily find that on Google. And here we see, okay, the P format specifier. What does it do? It prints out a pointer. So what we saw earlier here when running it is a pointer. And this is a pointer to a certain buffer on the stack. Okay, so that that's already great because if you have a stack address, that means that later you might be able to um, jump to your stack address to run code. But that is only possible if the NX bit is disabled. So I'm going to run checksec on this. Checksec takes a little while and that's going to tell us what kind of security is set on this binary. So we can have pi, we can have nx, uh, we can have all these different kinds of things. And what I'm looking for here specifically is to see if nx is set. Why? Well, we have a stack address, uh, so we have a place that we could possibly uh, jump to. And this nx bit, as we can see, it's disabled. If this were enabled, then that means that uh, memory can only be executable or readable or writable. So you can either write to memory, but then that memory won't be able to be executed anymore. So in that case, for example, we wouldn't be able to upload uh, shellcode on the stack, push shellcode on the stack, and then jump to it to run it. But with NX disabled, that means that we can actually push shellcode on the stack if we find like a buffer overflow somewhere, and then jump to the address. And we know we have a relative address here on the stack that we can calculate other addresses uh, using. So, so we can then jump to that shellcode and actually execute it because this bit is disabled. So that's great. Um, but let's keep looking in, in the code here. So that's the first option gives us that. So then we have the second option here, which is going to ask us for the password. It's going to scan. Let's see what this is. This is a string, I guess. Uh, so if we, yeah, this is a string of length 15. Uh, so it's going to scan that into this other one, which is 16 of length. So we don't have a buffer overflow there. And it's going to compare that to a uh, bad password. So we actually have the password here. So uh, I'm going to copy that and I'm already going to put that in Python. So here I'll say the password. 
is going to be equal to that, just so we have that for later. All right. So if that is, uh, if we enter the password correctly, we are gonna, it's gonna say access granted, and we can enter navigation commands. And for those navigation commands, it's gonna read uh, 137 bytes into this buffer, and that's the buffer of which we have the address. And but that buffer is only 76 bytes big, so we have a buffer overflow here. Um, okay, so that's really cool. We know, okay, there's a buffer overflow because we're reading more bytes in than we are getting out, and it's the buffer overflow is really easy to access because we have the password here. So let's actually see if we can put that uh, in, uh, in practice, see if that works. So if we run this bad computer, so first we're going to chase the joker, we're going to enter the password. Okay, then we enter the navigation commands, and here we want to enter uh, 137 something because that's the max that we can enter. So if you go Python dash C, we can print A times 137. Okay, let's copy that, paste that in here, and we actually see that currently nothing happens. Now, why does nothing happen? We over we have overflown this buffer, right? Why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it give us an error? Well, that's because it hasn't tried to uh, do, do something with it. So wh when does a buffer overflow occur? Well, when we try to return, uh, when does a segmentation fault occur rather? Well, when we return and we're trying to jump to an address that is just not uh, shellcode, that is just not code, uh, that's when it happens. So we want to get to this return now. Now, how do we get to this return? Let's see, so if we enter option two, and we do a wrong password, we exit. If we do a right password, we just loop back up. But what if we enter a three as an option here when it asks us to chase the, to chase the joker or to do something else? If we enter a three, then it should, uh, this if should make sure that we break out of this while loop here at top and that would cause us to return. So let's try entering option three here. And as you can see, okay, we returned and we got a segmentation fault. So that's perfect because we know that we have something that we can input that's going to override the uh, return address so that so then we can jump to a uh, place that we want and we also have this first option with tracking joker that's going to give us an address to the stack so if we jump to that address and uh, upload some shell code there then we know okay we can have some code execution here we can maybe run some um, some commands so that all sounds great and let's put that into practice by starting to write a, our program here so this program is going to automatically do this for us. Um, so we're going to import, obviously, pawn tools. So uh, actually I actually have to do from pawn, import everything. And then at the top here, we're going to say our IO input to output is going to be able to the process of this bad, um, bad computer binary. So this is going to open the Bad computer started as a process, and then we have an input and output here that we can read from and write from. So we have a couple of steps here. So the first step is it's just the enumeration of the binary, which is what we've been doing so far. We found this password, and this I just this place I use for storing all the things that we have found in the binary. Okay. So the second step is to get the leaked stack address. So leak stack address. Now, how do we leak the stack address? Well. We do that by entering option one here, and then we get a stack address. Perfect. So let's write some code that's going to do that for us. So we're going to first send a line after the symbol, because as, if you look here, you see, okay, when we receive this with a space, then we have to enter our input. So after we got that, we're going to send a one. Then we are going to say, okay, our stack address is then going to equal to the next line but we are going to strip that from all new lines and stuff. We're going to split that and then take the last of it. So why do we do that? Well, the line that we get is this. So we, if we split that on spaces and take the last argument here, we have this hexadecimal string here. Okay, so that's the first part of, of it. However, then we obviously only have a string with the hex, addre hex address and well, we would rather have um, it as a something that we can use, um, not a string, but a uh, bytes uh, and stuff like that that we can 
use with bond tools in our in our payload later. So for that, what we are going to do is we're going to turn them all into uh, into hex. So how do you do that? Well, we're going to loop over this. So let's see. Um, loop over every character. No, we want to. We're going to. What we want to do is we want to take the first two characters, turn them into uh, hexadecimal because then they are a string but then we want to take their value in hexadecimal and use the, and do that for all sets of two so that means that in our range we're going to start from the second one um, because the zeroth and the first are these and we want to get rid of those we're then going to um, go over the full length of this stack address and with a step size of two so that means we're going to use grab this, then grab that, then grab that, and then grab that, and so on, till the end. Okay, so that looks good. What are we going to do at the beginning here? Well, we want to um, grab the integer of... Okay, now I have to think here, because we want to grab the integer of those values in our stack address. So um, we have from i, from that index, till i plus 2, because we want to take 2. And OK, so that's going to take that, but we don't want the integer. We want this in base 16, so we have it in hexadecimal. All right. And then we want to turn that into a character again. OK, perfect. So that's going to be, let's let's actually run this and print that, see what, what it returns us because that was kind of extract and hard to explain. So I hope that by running this, this will make more sense. So as you can see, we have strings now representing the bytes that actually occurred. So for example, the first one is always going to be the same, 7f. We have the string here that represents the byte 7f. The next one is this and, and so on. So OK, then, then we can join those together. So we have one string. So we can join those together perfectly. And then we have the stack address. However, we want to make sure that the stack address is eight bytes in length. Why is that? Well, we're using we're uh, working with a 64-bit binary, and so if we're gonna jump to addresses, we want to make sure that they are always eight bytes because that's what's being pushed and popped. So to do that, we can simply use we're gonna take our stack address and then we're gonna R just this at eight bytes and if it's so R just means okay make sure that the length of this string is eight eight else add to the right the following and we're just gonna add a null byte to the right. Okay? So then lastly what we want to do is we want to unpack that at 64 bytes. So take our stack address and okay that sounds good. So this unpacking here, what it's going to do, it's going to take this string and put it as an integer. So now if I print the stack address here, we see we have it as an integer. Now why did I do that? Well, later if we want to work with the stack address, for example, say we calculate that our shellcode is 20 bytes from this stack address, then we can easily add and remove from it. Uh, if we want to use the stack address again, then we'll do a uh, pack 64 of the stack address again. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Uh, let's actually add a nice lock line here. So lock success and say, OK, leaked stack address is at. And then we'll print this nicely as bytes. OK, so if we run that, we have the stack address. Boom. As you can see, the R adjusting did add these no bytes. So these are eight bytes long now. Perfect exactly what we, want, what we want. So that's step one, leak the stack address. Step two is to do our actual buffer overflow. Okay, so for our buffer overflow, what do we want to do? Well, after we got the, the stack address, we want to switch to option two to chase joker. Uh, so let's run that to see what we want to do. So we want to chase joker, then we want to enter the password, which was this. And then here is where our pay, uh, payload occurs. Okay, perfect. So let's write that in code here. 
So we're again going to send a line after receive this again. We're going to send option two. We're then going to send a line after we receive password with our password that we supplied earlier. And that's that. And then after we receive uh, commands, we are going to supply our payload and our payloads will make that a times one, three, seven, because that's the max length that we could use. Okay, perfect. So knowing that we can run this, see what happens at the end here. I'm going to do an io.interactive to make sure that it doesn't shut down and it's going to show us what happens afterwards. Uh, okay, so run our program here. We see, okay, we leaked the stack address and now we are back at this option. So now we haven't gotten a segmentation fault or an end of file. So the last step that we needed to do is to trigger the return. So we're going to do step three is going to be to trigger the return. And how did we do that? Well, we sent three instead of two here, which is going to end the while loop and going to make sure that we return. Okay, let's see if that gives us a segmentation fault now. And it did uh, end of file. If I now exit this, we can see, okay, we get a code minus 11, which is a segmentation fault. Great, so that's exactly what we wanted. Now we need to work out how we can actually use this to jump to any address that we like. Now the first thing that we need to know is we need to find the offset uh, of, uh, we need to find the place that we need to jump to to, uh, to overwrite the return address where we're gonna jump to. So how does that, how are we gonna figure that out? Well, we know that this number has to be below 137, 137 and above 76 because uh, 76 is where we are um, overflowing the buffer and then 137 is the maximum and, and below that is where we were able to get the segmentation fault. Well, you can do this like manually, try to figure it out, but we can also create something that's called a cyclic string. So let's do that. And a cyclic string is pretty much going to be, um, let's me run this first from pawn, import everything. And then we can create a cyclic string and we'll create it of this length. So this is a string. And what we are gonna do now is we're gonna debug this binary. We're gonna use this string as an input. And then we're gonna see where it crashes. And the address that it tries to jump to is gonna be four bytes here or, or yeah, four bytes here or eight bytes here. And those are going to be shown to us. And then we can say, okay, hey, find these bytes in this string and tell me what offset they were found at. And that way we can know, okay, we need to ha add so much padding then we add to the return address so that we always jump to that address. So let's uh, do that. So for that, I'm going to open it with GDB. So we're going to do bat computer go. We can then run this. So first we're going to chase Joker. We have to enter the password. Okay. Enter the navigation commands. This is where we input our cyclic string here. And then we enter three to get the return. Okay. And now we see we have an issue or not an issue. We triggered a segmentation fault here, which is perfect, which is what we want. So now we need to look at what we were going to jump to. So as you can see, the instructor pointer and point pointer currently is pointing at return. So what is a return going to do? It's going to pop something from the stack into the instruction pointer and that's where it's going to go. So the value that it's going to pop is the following here because this is the SP is a stack pointer. So it's going to pop from the stack V triple A. Okay. So let's then use that into a cyclic find here. That's going to tell us, Hey, the offset is going to be 84. So, okay. That's cool. We have enumerated that here. So the return address offset is 84. Cool. Perfect. So now we know that our, our payload is going to consist of a padding. This padding is going to be times uh, any, any character times our return address offset. Following our padding, we are going to have our actual return address. 
now our return address is going to be the p64 of our stack address so we're going to pack that integer that we had up here we're going to pack that again um well actually that's not entirely true yet because we don't we don't have shellcode yet because we are still going to have to write our shellcode so our shellcode is going to be something here and then we add our shellcode at the end of it so our address that we want to jump to is this shellcode so what we have to do is we have to pack our stack address and that's going to jump at the beginning of this padding so then what we have to do is we have to add the return address offset to this and add another 8 bytes to be jumping to this shellcode. Okay, perfect. So now we need to generate our shellcode. So for that I am simply going to use shellcraft uh, from um, pawn tools here. So shellcraft is amazing. Uh, there's some documentation up here but it's pretty much just going to um, use assembly or you don't have to write your own shellcode you can pretty quickly grab it here we are going to take a look at the shellcode however um, let's actually do that right now so for that I'm going to go into debug mode here so context dot log level equals debug okay so then we can exit out of this quit oh okay we've already exited exit out of there and then we can run this file and with that mode, you see, we have a lot of debug statements here. And this is where I try to assemble our shellcode here. So, okay, our shellcode is going to do the following. It's going to run bin sh. But how is it going to do that? Well, it's going to call this, it's going to do a syscall here, which is at the bottom. And this syscall is interesting because it needs all kinds of certain variables, parameters, um, to work correctly. And for that, if you want to write your shellcode manually, there's this very cool Linux syscall, syscall table. So these is, this is going to specify all the kinds of parameters and arguments you need to supply in order to do this syscall. So for example, this first value here is the RAX. So for us, we're doing an, an, exec C, an exec VE. So the RAX needs to be set to 59. Now if we look in our shellcode here, at the bottom, we are um, pushing I would expect this to be pushing 59 here, um, but we are not. Did I write my shellcode correctly? Shellcraft.sh. Okay, that doesn't seem right for me. And actually, I know what I forgot. I forgot to set the context. And this context is going to make sure that it, that it knows that Pontools knows what is happening. So we're going to set the OS to be Linux and the Arch to be AMD64 and this is all stuff that you can get from running file on that computer uh, see 64-bit uh, here so we, we that's the context I'm gonna set and I think that's gonna fix that okay yeah so right now here we see at the end we push 59 to the stack and then we pop RAX here and what does that popping mean? That popping means we're going to take whatever you just pushed on a stack. So 59 is going to be an REX. Perfect. So then the RDI is going to be the file name of what we are going to execute. So let's see what we push in RDI. So in here we are moving RSP into RDI. RSP is a stack pointer. So we're moving a pointer that's on the stack into, into RDI. Uh, or, or we are um, some the stack is pointing to something and we are putting that pointer into RDI. What is the stack pointing at? Well, we just pushed RAX and in RAX we have this hex and this hex is, is bin sh. So that's how we put the file name on the stack. There is some more stuff here that's important for these other variables, but I won't go into that. Um, but I hope this kind of explains the basics of this shellcode and what is happening here. However, we are running this and we seem to be getting an error. We get an end of file error. So let's I quickly disable this debug mode again so we don't have a lot of output here. And this end of file error happens. Okay, we stop with an exit code of zero. Let's see what we do wrong here. Oh, okay, so we are inputting this here, our payload. But then it says, okay, roger that. And then it repeats the prompt. And this is where we would output three. However, 
we notice that it hasn't output 3, it's just, it has just continued for some weird reason. Well, why is that reason? That is probably because my payload is too long. Uh, if you recall here, we were allowed to input 137 bytes into this buffer, but my payload might be longer. So let's quickly add an assert statement here so that we get notified with a, something nicer than that error. That's, that's clear. So the length of our payload smaller than, and up here we're going to say, okay, max payload length was 137. Okay, so then we can use that max payload length here and say, okay, well, if it's too long, I'm going to say payload, let's make this format string, and too long. Okay, so we're going to show the max, and then in here, we're just going to show the length of our payload as well, so that we can see what we're working with. Okay, let's run that and see what happens now. So as we get an assertion error and it says, okay, payload of length 140 is too long, so we have three bytes too much in our payload. So that's that's a bummer. Would have been really nicely if it just fits snugly, but it doesn't in this case. So where are we losing space? Well, we're obviously losing space up here, where this padding is is long and and it's just using space that could be used for the shellcode. So let's actually rework this, and we're gonna say, okay, our shellcode. It's going to be at the top, so here as well. We're going to have our shell codes. That also means that our stack address is not going to have to be changed because the stack address points at the beginning of that uh, buffer and the shellcode is going to be at the beginning. However, we still need some padding in the middle and now for the length of the padding that's going to be a little different because it has to be this but minus the length of the shellcode that's already on the stack. Okay. So, does that look right? That looks right to me. Let's see what happens this time. Okay, so we see that we don't get the uh, assertion error anymore, so our payload is now long enough, but we get an end of file, and if we, uh, we still get a segmentation fault. So something still went wrong. And now this is very hard to know what went wrong in this case. So, I am going to jump into IDA, and we're going to attach the process so we can see exactly what is going uh, going to go wrong and we can uh, run through it dynamically. So in order to do that, I'm going to put a uh, statement here, just an input statement. Uh, that's going to stop execution so that we can connect to it in IDA. So if, we, if I run this, I'm going to say IDA. Okay, so now we can connect to it in IDA. So in IDA, we can say... Uh, so in IDA, I've also opened the binary. And I've set a debug point at this return statement in the main function. So now we can go to debugger, not there, we can go to debugger, attach to process, find our process here, which is going to be bad computer here. Okay, we can open that, and now it's going to attach to this process, it has to do some moving here, and we are going to be able to pretty much dynamically run through this. So currently we are here, I'm going to say play, I'm going to continue there, so, all right, now we have, in IDA, we have stopped on this return statement. Can I put this in graph? Yeah, we've stopped on this return statement here. On the stack, if we synchronize with it, yeah, we see here, we have our padding here, we have our shellcode here. So that all looks nicely. Let's see where we are going to jump to if we go in this return. So we step in this return and we immediately get a segmentation fold. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that we probably have to take a look at what we were actually jumping into. So let's see where our stack address is. Stack address is there. And that is synchronized with it again. That is right here. So that is what we were jumping towards. Now, does that look right? Well, from here, that might look right, but however, uh, the stack is, is kind of strange, and, and I always advise to look at the stack view here, and we can see, okay, this is backwards. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have our endian wrong, like, 
um, endian kind of you can have little or big endian and um, I'm not gonna go into explaining that um, but if you want that I will explain it in another video but we should probably here when we unpack this we should say okay we want the endian to be big now I believe that you can also see that if you run uh, file file Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> File, bad computer. Yep, there we go. Okay, so we actually can see the endian is here. So if it says LSB, that means it's the least significant bit. Um, so what does that mean? Well, the ordering here is going to be with the least significant bit uh, first. And in this case, we put the most significant bits first on the stack. So we used little endianess, but we wanted to use big endianess. So uh, if this says MSB, then then you should use little. But uh, for this case, what we said we want big because this is the least significant bit is going to be first. Okay, so let's rerun that with our correct endianess. So we are going to have to connect to IDA again. Stop running this. Attached to the process. All the way at the bottom here, bad computer. Okay. Right, so we're going to move the segments again. Then we're going to have to press play here. Get that going. And then we get back to our return. And now, if you look at the return address on the stack, we notice that, okay, the least significant bit is first here. And uh, then we look in the stack view, we notice, okay, yeah, now it is correctly here because this stack view edits it so it's uh, in, the, in the viewable version. Okay, perfect. Now let's step into this return. And we notice that we jump somewhere, and this is our shellcode, if you remember. So let's jump through our shellcode. So we're going to jump through it because we, we correctly jump through our shellcode. However, our code still gives us as a segmentation fault. So what goes wrong? Well, here in green on the stack, you can see what we are executing. So this is our shellcode, and then past that is, is, is just our stack that we're not executing. However, pay close attention to this blue character here, which is where our stack pointer currently is. And as we jump through it, notice that with every push, it, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna jump closer to our shellcode. Okay. And it's very close now. And then we're gonna do this last push here. And that's gonna override some of our shellcode here. So now we've overridden written some of our own shellcode by running the shellcode. And that is, if we jump next, it's gonna give us the segmentation fault. Okay. So that's an issue. We need to we need to make some more space on the stack. We need to make some more space on the stack so that we don't overwrite our own code. Now, how can, how can we do that? Well, if we saw earlier that pushing removed space from the stack, it removed eight bytes uh, with each push. Well, what if we try to not push but pop, so that we create more space? So we, yeah, we'll have to add some shell code for that. Again, you don't notice by heart, but if you just go onto the documentation for pawn tools and then shellcraft and you do pop and you have this pop ad here which is just going to pop all the registers on the stack so okay before our shellcraft here before our sh we want to do a shellcraft dot pop and this is going to pop all of the registers We'll add that, throw it into assembly, and that's going to be our shellcode now. So let's hope now that that isn't too much, um, because if, if this pop ID is too long, then we're going to violate the length again, but then we could simply just pop one uh, address instead of all of them, or pop one register instead of all of them, which would also be fine. But for this case, let's try this first. So if we run this now, okay, we're not connecting to IDA now, but we'd see, okay, we don't get this end of file, and in fact, we have code execution now. So, let's uh, quickly put this debugger on here so you can see what this pop ad actually did. So, okay, as you can see, this shellcode now contains a lot of pops, which is going to make space for us on the stack to get over that issue that we saw earlier where we were uh, overriding our own shellcode on the stack, which is why it couldn't execute. So now we have a working thing here, but this is working locally. Now, often there is differences or slight changes with with how things work 
on the remote. So let's make sure this also works on the remote server here. So we are going to make a remote connection to the hack the box server, which is running this binary. So if we copy that, okay, take this and let's see if that works on the remote as well. Okay, so let's also quickly remove that idle line since we don't need that anymore. And we see we go into interactive mode here and if we type id we see hey we are root here ls and we can see okay there's flag.txt so we can so we can cat flag.txt and get the flag that way so uh, that was it for this video this was a uh, the second pawn challenge in the intro to binary exploitation series here i want to do all of them if possible um for me as well this is kind of a bit uh, still a learning uh, experience because I don't do uh, binary exploitation that often. Um, so I'm trying to explain things here and there, but if you have anything that you were like, okay, this you went over quickly, I, I would love to see that like kind of featured in the next video. Say something, say, hey, do that, explain that fully in the next video, and then I'll make sure that I do. Um, but yeah, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like, subscribe, uh, and I hope to see you back for another video.